Catechumen's greetings. We're looking at the fifth chief part of the catechism that comes after holy baptism. We're looking at holy absolution, confession and absolution. Last week we looked at the forgiveness of sins and specifically confession, how we confess our sins to, before God and then also how we confess God as our Savior, the two parts of confession, our sin and God's grace. This week we're going to look at the next part of that. You'll find it on page 314 in your catechism, the Office of the Keys. But before we do, we start with our Lord's Word. It's there that we see how he has instituted absolution and also how he has instituted the Office of Holy Ministry. So in this we will also be looking at the Office of Pastor, and you can think about what, what is a pastor, what does it mean to be a pastor. So in John chapter 20, verse 21. This is after Jesus has been crucified. He's been resurrected from the dead. And this is where his apostles are hiding in the locked room. And Jesus comes into the room with them. And verse 21, Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. So there we see what is called the Office of the Keys. We see the institution of the Office of Holy Ministry, where Jesus says, As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And then, of course, later the apostles go and lay their hands on other men, to put them into the office of holy ministry, the office of pastor. So, with that, now let's look at a couple things in the catechism first. This is what is in the box on page 314, where it says, what is the office of the keys? The office of the keys is that special authority with which Christ has given his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. Where is this written? And then it quotes John 20, what we just read in the, in the Bible. And then it says, what do you believe according to these words? I believe that when called ministers of Christ deal with us by his divine command, in particular when they exclude openly unrepentant sinners from the Christian congregation and absolve those who repent of their sins and want to do better, this is just as valid and certain, even in heaven, as if Christ our Lord dealt with us himself. So we have this, it's called, the, the called ministers of Christ. They, they will be called maybe nowadays ministers, sometimes priests, sometimes fathers, sometimes pastors. It depends on which tradition. Luther himself was called a pastor. He was also called a father. Um, so with, with that, we get to see that it says that the person, the man is called, put into this office to forgive sins. And what we can notice is he's not put into the office, it says, to talk about the forgiveness or to describe forgiveness. There is that. That's done in a sermon, for instance. But it says to forgive sins. That's what Christ says to his apostles. Whosoever sins, you forgive. So Jesus, through the mouth of these apostles, is delivering the actual forgiveness that Jesus speaks from his own mouth. He's using these men as his instruments. So this is the office of holy ministry, where a man is put into an office, not by his own worthiness, not by his own authority. This is not an office instituted or created or designed by the church. It is instituted by Christ in the same way that baptism is instituted by Christ. Holy Communion is instituted by Christ. These are not rituals or traditions in the church. These are things handed over to us from our Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. So now to talk about this office of holy ministry. What do we understand? What do you understand when you think of a pastor? And we might be tempted to think, well, a pastor is a leader of the church, or he's a coach. He's, he's got a team, and he's the coach of the team. And... Maybe there's 
nothing wrong in our world with being a coach or a leader. Actually, there's not. Don't you want a good coach? If you're playing football or baseball or if you have a favorite team, you want someone who can coach that team and teach them how to win. Is that a pastor? Those words, coach, leader, are nowhere used in Scripture for the pastor. In Scripture, the words used for a pastor, the most predominant word is servant. Also, under shepherd. That's the word that comes in as pastor. Maybe you can see that in the word a little bit. The word pastor comes from the Latin. It has the same root as the word for pasture, where you pasture sheep. You put them out to eat grass. And so a pastor is one who is pasturing sheep. In the church, he's an under shepherd of the good shepherd Christ. But that means he's a servant. He's serving the Lord's beloved sheep with the Lord's good food and water. In the case of the church, that's his word of forgiveness. That's his sacraments. So you have a pastor who is to be known as nothing other than a servant. There's one verse in scripture where a pastor is called an officer. And sometimes that's mistranslated as a leader. But an officer is not a leader. An officer is serving in the office of someone else, like a police officer. He's a servant serving in the office to protect the community. But he's serving in an office set up by the mayor or the governor or however it is we want to describe that. So that's the first thing we want to see. A pastor is a servant, a servant of Christ Jesus, a servant to the sheep who belong to Jesus. Then in our current world, our current culture, we can ask, why did Jesus set pastors to be men? He called the 12 men to be apostles when Judas left. He replaced Judas with Matthias, another man. And then he also added in Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, another man. Why men? And what you'll find in scripture is nothing about pastors are to be men because they're better leaders, because I know what a pastor is anyway. Not because they're better speakers, they're better at rhetoric, or they're better at leading a convention or anything like that. Nothing. Well, then why did Jesus set men to be pastors? It would have been possible for him to also have women, because that was very common in that world. All of the pagan altars, the Greeks and the Romans, they all had priests and priestesses. They knew that. But Jesus set men to be pastors. Why? Now, let me read you a verse about Jesus. This is from the book of Ephesians. And it's some verses that are read at the marriage ceremony, the marriage service for a Christian wedding. And it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So there we have the Apostle Paul talking about the church as being the bride of Christ. And Christ is the groom. He's the groom who cleanses the church with the washing of water in the word. That's baptism. But that means that the church, this body of believers, this corporate collection of believers, the church is known as the bride. All the men and women bound together in one body to be known as the bride of Christ. Christ is the groom. How does he take care of his bride? Not by commanding her around, not by overlording it with her. Rather, he is groom to his bride as he washes her, cleanses her, and makes her resplendent. That is the gospel. Christ is our bride. We are all members, or our groom. Christ is our groom. We are members together of one body, the bride. And now when he sets men to be servants, he sets them to be servants in the office of husband to the church, to wash and cleanse, to take care of, to bring the bride always out of any shame or guilt, 
to give the forgiveness of sins and set her next to Christ in all resplendent glory, which is nothing other than the forgiveness of sins. So the pastoral office is this office of being a servant of this Lord who loves the church as a man loves his bride. Thank you.